Every garden has this in common, the need for water. We'll explore options for gardens large and small next. Over the past 20 years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore ways to create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped to transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to the Garden Home. Now this is something we can all relate to, watering, no matter the size garden we have. Now let me turn this off. You know, watering's one of my favorite things to do in the garden. I love to deep soak my flower beds and containers throughout the spring and summer. It gives me an opportunity to connect with my garden as well as do a little daydreaming. But you know, these days with such a busy schedule, I've had to resort to using things like soaker hoses to help make my garden flourish. Now you may be saying, gosh, these aren't very attractive. But let me tell you, they are very effective and you actually can't see them. In fact, this flower border has soaker hoses down in there. You can't see them because of all the foliage and bloom. Now, whenever I talk about water, the inevitable question of how do I deal with mosquitoes comes up. And so I wanna talk about how to safely deal with this pest in our gardens. I'll also introduce you to a couple of cute pups that aren't going to be particularly happy with me when they see me coming with the wash tub. Come on pups, bath time. I'm not sure who's gonna get more of a bath, me or the dogs. While we're out in the garden home project, I wanna show you these amazing dry stack stone walls the guys have been working on. It will really give the garden a great look, and it reminds me of those pastoral landscapes in England. And you'll never guess where we got many of the stones. Okay, now let's talk about color. If you like the wow factor that this flower border represents, then I wanna show you how you can get this look yourself. You know, it's the nature of fashion to change. We see it in the clothes we wear, the homes that we decorate, and even in the garden. But you know, throughout the years, I've discovered that some colors, well, they never go out of vogue. For instance, pink. It's so good because it mixes with so many other color families. You might say it plays well with others. Now, I wanna showcase some of these show outs in the border and in this container. One of my favorites for blooming from frost to frost, early spring to late fall, is this little Intensia phlox. It actually comes from the wilds of Texas and Oklahoma. You can find it blooming on the roadsides, but this one is an improved hybrid that's a super performer in the garden. Now take a look at this little charmer. This is a petunia called Supertunia Vista Bubblegum Pink. Now I have to say, I have used this in my garden for several years now. I just keep coming back to it because it shows off with so many blooms throughout the entire growing season. Now these are two good flowering plants, but let's take a look at some foliage plants that really help build out this border. Now this is a copper plant, and you can see with leaves like this, well, you can bring as much color to the garden as you can with flowers. I just think it's an outstanding selection for the border because I love its big, bold texture. Now what's great about this plant is the hotter it gets, the better it grows. It'll grow up to four feet tall. Now another great performer is this variegated canna. This one's called Tropicana, and I love the striations in the leaves. There you can find pink, magenta, chartreuse, and even deep burgundy. So it's the perfect complement to any shade of pink. Now let's take a look at the broader view. You see, this bed or this composition is about 12 feet long and about four feet deep with a boxwood or evergreen hedge across the back, which serves as the canvas to paint this picture on. Now, the thing that I want you to recognize is the ratio of bloom to foliage. It's about 50-50. I've got the foliage plants, which include the ones we just discussed, along with some coleus and others, and then bloomers with the euphorbias and various colors of the intensia flocks all working together. Now, what's great about this is that once you plant all these plants in the bed, using the same color family, and I used about 25 plants here, they begin to work together, conspire if you will, and look natural. You can see they look quite happy, and when they're happy, well, I'm happy. So let's recap how to get this look in your garden. Remember, 50-50 bloom and foliage, you want similar growing conditions, 
and pack lots of plants in. And of course, don't forget you want to feed, feed, feed. Now let's talk about the importance of moisture or watering. Earlier I pointed out that I use soaker hoses in these beds. The reason I do that is because it's a great way to keep the soil consistently moist. Now I said the soil. You see, it's not good to spray the foliage in blooms because you can set up an environment that's ideal for fungus and other pests. Now, when you buy soaker hoses, there are a few things you want to keep in mind. First, buy a high quality soaker hose, one that's going to last a while. And the way that you can make sure that they're going to last in the garden is buy one that has UV protection. You see, sunlight breaks down these rubber hoses. When I lay them in the bed, I put them on top of the ground and then I cover them with a layer of mulch, another layer of protection. Now, I also like soaker hoses that are made of recycled rubber. It's good to know that this stuff hasn't ended up in a landfill somewhere. Now, you want your soaker hose to slowly weep water or to drip it out close to the plant's roots. The best way to hold them in place is with one of these wire pins. Use the pins in the garden to hold down the hoses. Now, I think it's important for me to point out one thing here. You realize that under here, we're creating a very moist and dark environment, which is perfect for, guess what, slugs and snails. But there's some ways to deal with these pests. Why don't we step around to the front and take a look at some tips. The first thing to realize is that slugs and snails do not like to cross certain barriers. I've tried a variety of things, such as putting a ring of wood ash around plants. However, it has to be replaced every time it rains. Another barrier you can create is with sweet gum balls. You see, the sticky quality of these seed balls is something that slugs and snails do not like to cross. All you have to do is pile them up around the plants that you want to protect. For smaller plants, you can actually crush these balls with a hammer. It goes around them much easier. Hopefully, some of these tips will help keep your favorite plants off the menu of some of nature's slimiest and toughest pests. Okay, let's get back to the subject of water and a little problem solving. As you can see in my fountain garden, I've got a real mess on my hands. Just look at my pool. It's filling up with algae, and the reason, well, the pump broke on my fountain about a week ago. Now, I have a dilemma here because I have little baby tadpoles and young frogs developing in this pool, so I've got to do something to save them. I can't just pump the water out, but I have mosquito larvae developing in here at the same time. Now, when the fountain is running, I don't have this problem because water is circulating through, and as you may know, mosquitoes will not lay their eggs in water that's circulating. They love stagnant still water like I have here. Now, you can use a variety of products, but there's some out there that are like these mosquito pellets that you can drop into the water, which will keep the larva from developing. Now, if you use these, you need to make sure that they're safe. They're safe for children, pets, and certainly wildlife. Now, one last thing to keep in mind, if you use one of these pest control measures, you want to make sure that you use them in contained vessels of water like this pond, not in a situation where the water would spill out into a larger water source. Now, for those into an all-organic approach to ridding your water features of mosquitoes, you might try some goldfish. They seem to eat them up, quite literally. They love mosquito larvae. Now, another simple mosquito prevention is simply inspecting your garden periodically for standing water. It's amazing how after a rain, water can pool up and you don't even notice, but the mosquitoes do, and that's where they lay their eggs. Another natural method of dealing with mosquitoes is citronella. Now, I'll be honest, this is a hit or miss solution, but the ambience that citronella torches and candles can bring to the garden, well, just take a look. Citronella is an aromatic oil that's derived from a tropical grass which is a close cousin to the same lemongrass that's so popular in oriental foods. As an oil, it's long been prized for its fragrance and insect repelling qualities. Now you can use this oil by burning it in torches like this. When lit, the atmosphere they create is perfect for outdoor dining and entertaining. You can also use these citronella candles. They come in a variety of sizes and containers. This one is put in a galvanized bucket for placing in the garden. The candle wax has been blended with the same oil used in the torches. And you have to admit, these votive citronella candles make an enchanting addition to the dinner table. You know, we're not the only ones who have to deal with pests in the garden. Let's round up Lucky and Angel and see if we can't give them a little relief. 
Well, Angel's not very happy right now, but it's that time of year. It's tick and flea season. So she's getting a shampoo, but not only is she getting clean, she's also being protected against ticks and fleas. You see the shampoo I'm using will actually kill ticks and fleas on contact. Ooh, there's a tick right there. And it will kill flea eggs for up to 28 days. I know, just for a moment, just a little longer. Good girl, back in the water. Welcome to my design studio. Now this is the part of the show where I take submissions from you, the viewers, of your property and we look at the landscape and think about how it can be improved. Now take a look at this house. This is in Florida and it's new construction. You can see they haven't quite finished the front. They're well underway. Now I just want to point out a few things about this house I like. I think this is a great looking brick. It looks like a, an antique brick. They've got a generous porch here. It's going to run all the way down like so. And it looks like there's plenty of opportunity for planting. It, it looks like it's in a big, wide space. So what I'd like to do is first look at the views. Now, we're a bit limited by the photograph that's been submitted. But you can look over here, and you can see that there is a barn or a large metal structure back on this side. And then back here on this end, we can see a similar building that probably needs to be screened. Now, one of the first things I like to do is screen the view. What I do is stand inside the house and look out all of the windows to see if there are unsightly objects I want to screen or if there are beautiful objects that I want to frame somehow. So what I would do here is screen out this barn by either planting some kind of a hedge on this side, a cluster of evergreens. These could be hollies. Uh, it's in Florida, so they could be uh, the native Yopon holly, which would be very beautiful and beneficial to wildlife. Uh, in terms of trees, you could come up behind an evergreen hedge with a large tree. Red maples are native to Florida, would be a perfect solution here. You might even get some good fall color with a red maple back here. Now over here on the other side, I might repeat the same theme. You could use another red maple where just the edge of it might come in over here, but rather than the Yopon holly hedge, since this is in Florida, you could use sasanquas. I love Camellia sasanqua. It blooms in the fall, and you could do a big bank of them here. In fact, you could even come off this corner of the house and create a garden room over here on this side, which would serve as an extension of the house. So this wall of hedge could come across and be an extension of the house and you could have a break in it where you could come around from the front up to the house like this and then you could create a path that then comes around to this side garden which could be a flower garden. This is where you could have some sort of themed garden. It could be an old-fashioned flower garden. It could be a butterfly garden. It could just be an open yard for the children to play in. Now across the front of the house what I would do is probably anchor the corner the nice evergreen shrub here. Maybe it's a Laura Pedalum. That's a Chinese witch hazel, which has wonderful fringy blooms in the spring. And then a mass planting all around the base of the house like this of azaleas could be terrific. Maybe some of the large indicas. Now, over time, they'd have to be pruned, but they have really big blooms. And I would probably choose a white to echo the white of the trim color of the house. Then in front of it, all along here, in front of that bank of azaleas, I would come in with a simple ground cover, probably a dwarf mondo grass or an Asian jasmine for a flat, dark green planting all the way across to what could be a wonderful decorative gate here. Then I'd punctuate each side of the porch with something low. Maybe it's a boxwood um, on each side here, and then leave a pocket of space on either side in front of the boxwood for seasonal color. In Florida, in the hot sun, I'd probably go with something like lantana. Sort of a buttery, creamy white would be great if it's in shade. A big mass planting of caladiums would be fantastic. Now, what I would do on this side of the porch, you can see they haven't quite bricked it over here, so I would repeat the same composition that I created here, where on the corner, 
I used the loripedalum. I'd pull a loripedalum over there on that side so it's symmetrical. I'd mass plant the azaleas across the front and then come across with a ground cover, in this case probably the Asian jasmine. Now we've got a big tree here screening the barn. We've got a big tree over there in the back beyond the corner of the house. I think it might be nice, I'm not actually standing obviously in the front of this house, but it might be nice to have a big tree that might come up here to offer some shade from that hot Florida sun. Okay, now let's focus on this side because we've got a blank wall over here and I think we've got a real opportunity for a garden and I've sort of set that up already with this idea of the path coming around with a gate here. You could put in a pair of brick piers with some really beautiful decorative gate. It could be in white to match the trim of the house. Probably what I would do is on this wall create some sort of trellis. Be perfect for growing a beautiful climbing rose maybe a new dawn rose that would climb on this wall. You could do a similar trellis here and maybe a bench is placed just below the trellis. And then on each side of this entry, to really accent the entry, why don't we think about on the back side of this hedge coming up with a pair of crepe myrtles. would come up like that. That would really set off the entry into this little side garden. It's so much fun to take a new house like this and explore all the different possibilities. Now let's talk about a few finishing touches. I mentioned the porch earlier and what I like about it, it's really deep and generous. So what if you had a pair of containers on each side of the front door? Some big Boston ferns in them would be great. And what about some rocking chairs? Maybe uh, some either dark green rocking chairs on each side by the windows and some sort of table. I would create an outdoor room here, a place where you could come out and sit and enjoy the garden on what in effect is a transitional space or yet another room to the house. Of course, I think it's important to remember our visitors when we're creating a new garden. So lighting is very important. I might come out to the street. Now I really can't tell where the street begins, but you may want to put a really handsome light pole and light fixture here and then up on the porch maybe a pair of handsome traditional fixtures on each side of the door there where they will say welcome to your guests. So there you have it. Quite a transformation don't you think? If you've ever tackled a construction project, you know one of the most challenging aspects of it is, well, waiting for the end results. You have to have a lot of patience. Well, at least that's the case with me. You know, when we started creating this environmentally friendly garden home, I was anxious to see various components come together. But it wasn't until these stone walls were finished that I think we were really making some progress. Dry stacking stones is an old method for building retaining walls and creating fencing as well as clearing fields. You see them all over this country and certainly in England. They add an elegant yet bucolic feeling to the landscape. You see what we have here in my garden home is a series of terraces that step down in the garden and divide it into long rooms and corridors. Let's just put it into perspective with the drawing. If you start with the cottage, you walk across the croquet lawn and then down the center pathway that runs down the middle of the stone terraces. On each side are gardens, and beyond is a vista of the river. The team of craftsmen that assembled these walls follow time-honored principles. You see the skill and craftsmanship that they employ, while well, it's been handed down from one generation of the family to the next. Just take a closer look at how these stones are laid. I mean, it really is art. Steve Coe of The Course Doctors tells us a little bit about what goes into making these walls so durable and long-lasting. Structurally, we start our walls with bigger, bigger pieces at the bottoms, and the, the rock is delivered in bulk. It's basically field stone collected here in Arkansas by a, a, a contractor, and the guys break them up and size them with rock hammers and place different size rocks where you don't have uh, exact lines of symmetry. Some of the smaller pieces are used as shims where you don't have the roller coaster type look within the wall. And as they go up into the courses, we use a string line with the proposed elevations. The top layer is, uh, stays as consistent as possible with the with the string line, some smaller pieces and mortar are used to finalize the top layer. 
And behind the wall is, is landscaping filter fabric. Uh, we don't recommend using heavy gauge plastics and things of that nature because it deteriorates over time. The landscape fabric allows water to penetrate through between some of the cracks if necessary. We have gravel and drainage behind the, the wall that daylights at each end. And we also come up and move the earth up in lifts and we use plate compactors and the bulldozer to compact so it'll never fall over. It's all hand woven and, and wedged and I mean you, you can't pull it out. The weight of the wall actually of the stone actually holds a lot of it in place. Because the land out here slopes and I wanted some level areas, I depended on terraced walls or retaining walls to help create that effect. Now this did two things. One, well the stone walls are beautiful so it really set the mood or the ambience. And the other is it helped retain the soil so whenever it rained it didn't wash the soil down the hill. Now we talked about this project being environmentally friendly. You may be wondering, how does that relate to stone? We well, see if materials have to be trucked long distances, you consume a lot of fossil fuels, which really isn't good for the environment. So we used stone from a local source, and some of the stone actually came from this place. Now we consider the rocks that were gathered here on the site, well, don't you think that's a form of recycling? After all, we've removed a nuisance from the field or the garden, and we've put it to constructive use. Now a little earlier in the show, we talked about using soaker hoses as an effective way to water flower beds, but what about containers? Now there are three different ways that I approach watering containers. One is use the old basic time-honored saucer to help collect water. The second is to use a water retentive polymer that's blended into the potting soil that you use in the container. And the third is a drip irrigation system like this. You see, these systems are available to the general public now because they don't cost a lot of money or take a lot of time to install. Anyone can do it. And they also help you save money. You don't put all your time and energy at risk that you've put into beautiful pots like this. I think this one's a knockout. It's in this beautiful glazed jar, and here we have a Mexican feather grass along with some blue salvia and blue terrenia. Okay, so you may be asking, how do you put one of these things together? Well, it's really simple. It starts at the house or at the spigot. And there you can attach a timer so you can regulate when the water comes on and the amount of flow. From there, you attach a half inch line that runs, well, out to where your containers are. In this case, it runs along the deck. From there, you take a smaller line, this line, this size, and you insert it into that half inch line. This little spaghetti line then feeds directly into the pot through an emitter, and that emitter has a spike on it, which allows you to stick it into the soil so it will stabilize itself and doesn't move around. Now, what's great about the little emitter, you can turn this in such a way that you can regulate the flow of water. It's that simple, and what a great way to take care of your containers throughout the growing season. Over the years, I've had an opportunity to design lots of gardens, and I have to say, this is one of my favorites. And I think that the aspect of this garden that I like the most is this garden room. It just feels like an extension of the house. And these homeowners have gone to such great lengths to make it feel comfortable and inviting. Now, when I began designing my garden home, I wanted to create some very unique outdoor living spaces. Spaces that help me connect with nature, but still had the comfort of the inside, like you see here. Now, one of those spaces is a sleeping porch. I know that sounds like a crazy idea, and it's an old-fashioned one, but doesn't it sound good? Not so many years ago, well, before central heat and air and air conditioning, people put porches, typically on the second floor, for sleeping. These were screened with high ceilings and sometimes had ceiling fans. They were the perfect place to sleep during those hot summer nights. Well, we've certainly covered a lot in today's show. We've seen how to create a robust flower border touched on different types of irrigation and had some fun with pets in the garden. Right now, I think I'm just gonna enjoy this beautiful porch before going back to work on the Garden Home Project. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. Mm -hmm.